Agape Christian Worship Center. I'm Brother Times. Welcome to Sunday School from Agape Christian Worship Center. Remember, you can always reach us at agapechristianwc.org. You can reach us on our Facebook page, also our YouTube channel. So hello to first-time visitors, long-time visitors, members, and friends. A quick reminder, remember today we will be fellowshipping in Rancho Cucamonga with Emmanuel Praise Fellowship. The address is 95 7th Street in Rancho Cucamonga. Don't go to no 7th Street in Victorville. But we gonna be, we ain't gonna be there. But we gonna be worshiping with Emmanuel Praise Fellowship. Once again, that address is 95 7th Street, Rancho Cucamonga. So that's where we will be. So I want to make sure everybody knew that service starts at 1015. You know, it's nine o'clock. So if you got a late start thinking you was going to be the Victor Bill. No, nah, we ain't going to be there. So hurry up, take a quick shower, still go on and brush them teeth, eat your breakfast and go on, meet us down there at 1015. So I just want to make sure everyone knew that. So let's go ahead and get started with Sunday school now. But before we start, let's go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you once again to be here, to be gathered in your name. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for Jesus Christ dying for our sins so we can have an opportunity to fellowship with you and be with you forever, Lord. So, Lord, we pray right now that your spirit can lead, move, and guide through this lesson so we can all get a great understanding of your word and so we can apply this word in our lives. So we can turn around and let our light shine and we can pray if someone else needs to hear a gospel message that we can give it to them, Lord. So we just pray that you can continue to strengthen us, strengthen anyone who is sick right now, anyone that is discouraged, please help them to be able to see you and to turn their life to you. And if they already know, you just continue to strengthen their faith, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's get started. Matthew 17. I don't know why I always say this because it seems like I don't make it, but we hope to get to 18. We want to be starting Matthew 18 next week. I know we've been in Matthew forever, but you know, I'm just a, you know, I'm just a poor little sheep following my shepherd. You know, my shepherd, Pastor Allison, you know, he likes to go real slow you know, on these, on these scriptures and stuff. So I'm just following after him. So, so please don't blame me. I'm just your humble servant. All right, let me stop before I get in trouble. But hopefully we can get, get to 18. Let's get started now. Matthew 17, we're reading from the New King James Version. Remember, you got any questions, comments, please put them in the chat. And we will get back with you. We may not get back with you right at that moment, but we're going to get back with you, okay? So let's start with verse 11. This was right after the Mount of Transfiguration, right after Peter was like, oh, man, we need to build three tabernacles for, for you, Elijah, and Moses. And then, and then right then, Jesus had to say, no, nah. not Jesus, but the Father said, no, nah, this is my son. Hear ye him. Then they got nervous. They got afraid. And they were scared, but then when they looked up, they saw Jesus only. I love how it says that. There's only one way to the Father, Jesus only. Only way to get saved of your sins, Jesus only. There ain't no other way. So then that led us to this point. And when in, right after that, Jesus said, don't tell nobody this. This was Peter, James, and John. Wasn't a whole lot of them. So let's get to not 11. Let's go to verse 10, right? 17, 10. And his disciples asked him saying, why then, then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already and they did not know him 
but did to him whatever they wish. Likewise, the son of man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Now, when he said this at the first, he said, indeed, Elijah must come first and restore all things. And he's come already. That seemed like a contradiction. But once again, like we talked about last week, we understand that the first time he's coming at the lamb, next time he's coming as the king. But under both circumstances, there is going to be an Elijah coming forth. First, form of Elijah. First one is what? Was John the Baptist. And he came to restore all things. That's why he was in the wilderness teaching and preaching about repentance for your sins. And he was baptizing people in that he was restoring things. I understand that the message got out because he was in the wilderness by himself. People was coming from Jerusalem and Judea, all different kinds of places. People was coming to him. And in that he was restoring things. Then we talked about Elijah, Elijah the prophet. And then we went to we went to where it talks about the two witnesses in Revelation 11. And we talked about at that moment, the two witnesses are going to be restoring all things. And Elijah's going to be one of them. Because they're talking about it. There's going to be one that's going to be able to close up heaven. Rain from heaven. And that's what Elijah did. When you go back to the Old Testament, showing that that's him. And at that moment, him and the other witness was Moses, which was the two we just read about earlier in the scripture, are going to be there to restore things. When we're talking about restore things, bringing things back to what they were. So it's really bringing people and turning their eyes back to God. The same way that John the Baptist did when it talks about Elijah has come already. Now we're talking about the Elijah that's going to come first before the second. Because we say, understand that once they come with that final message, per se. And then we know when they're gone. Right after that, 11, then in 13 comes the mark of the beast. And if you take the mark of the beast in Revelation 13, that's it. Ain't no coming back from that. But in every circumstance, we have to understand whether it's John the Baptist, Elijah, the form of Elijah, or Elijah in Revelation 11, he's always going to give the world the opportunity to accept him. He doesn't slack countless promise, but which that no man would perish. That's why, that's why he came back in. He wants everyone to come to repentance. So that's what was talking about right at this scripture. And then it talks about when, he, when they said they did with the first John the Baptist that came already, whatever they wish, and they're going to do the same to the Son of Man. Then they clearly understood they were talking about John the Baptist. And then it really brought us to this scripture right here in verse 14. And boy, that's he. And we're kind of going to look a little deeper into it with Mark, because Mark has a little bit more in depth. We kind of briefly talked about it, but let's really get into it today. Verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. Let's pay attention real quick. We go back to 14. He was kneeling down. As we talk about one of the proof, proofs that Jesus is God, is he received worship. This man came to him kneeling down. He said, no, man, get up. Well, like the disciples that was in Acts, when somebody bowed to him, like, man, you better get up. No, Jesus didn't say that. So that's one thing we got to pay attention. But he said he suffered severely and he was falls into the fire and to the water. Mark is going to get deeper into that. 16. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. I brought him to your people, to your f -f 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 followers. That's what disciple me, right? And they couldn't do nothing with him. Let's keep reading. 
Then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. I truly believe right at that moment, he was talking to the disciples. When he said, how long shall I be with you? Who was he with the most? Them. Who couldn't kill the boy? Them. He said, man, I got to do everything. 18. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Yeah, we're going to get to Mark. Mark get, get really deep. 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately. Very smart. I ain't trying to get clown. We can ask him later. And said, why could we not cast it out? And this is kind of where we ended, but we're still going to continue right here. Says so. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Pastor preached on this from Luke last week, and we kind of talked about this too. When we talk about faith as a mustard seed, understand a mustard seed is extremely small. But here's the thing, it doesn't matter, as we talked about last week, how small your faith is, it matters about the source that you believe in. Doesn't matter how much faith you have, it'll ma it, it matters what you have faith in. Because understand, faith by itself it's not going to accomplish anything outside of faith in Jesus Christ. Let me make sure, make sure I make that clear. I can, I can go to, I can go to the gym, have much faith as I want to, man. Go ahead, man. Put four hundred pounds. I'm finna bitch press this thing. I got it. I got it. I got it. I get up under there. First of all, if I can even lift it off the rack. But if I get it off the rack, what's that weight going to do? It's going to come right on my chest. If it don't kill me. It's sure going to leave a big old line across my chest. Now I'm walking around a line across my chest talking about, oh, man, that's the birthmark. Mm -hmm. Okay, whatever. Right? But I had all the faith in the world. But the problem was what? The source, myself, couldn't get it done. But with Christ, it's different. When we have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, as long as it's in Jesus, we can move mountains. As long as it's in Jesus, we can accomplish anything. As long as we have faith in God, it doesn't matter the size. It matters about the source we believe in, not the size of the faith. Let's keep going. He says, you can move mouth and nothing is impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. We're going to go deeply into that prayer and fasting. But right now, we want to understand why Jesus got to the point where he talked about in verse 17, oh, faithless and perverse generation. Perverse is something that is corrupt and contrary to direction. And we talk about Jesus, he's what? The way, the truth, and the life. He is the only direction that you can use to get to God, the Father. This is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. So anything outside of faith in Jesus is perverse. Now, we can talk about different perversions and different things that people do to people and all that. We can talk about that. But at the end of the day, the perverse generation is any generation that doesn't believe in Jesus. That's it. Everything else is just the effects of not believing. 
So what he is saying is this is, look, if you my disciples and your faith can't get it done, what else is there? In the future, you are going to be bringing people to Christ. If this is the best you got, what is going on here? Let's be honest. When we was kids, our parents sometimes would be like, oh, no. That's when they just turned around. This was a Jesus. This is a Jesus moment. He was like, really? Our parents would be like, that's when they start being, oh, that's your son. No, that's your son. No, he's yo. Now, when we do something great, oh, that's my baby. They taking pictures. This wasn't one of them moments for the disciples. This is a terrible moment right now. Jesus is sitting here like, how long am I going to be here? Man, it's time to go home. They still don't get it. Let's see why. You know what? Let's define faith first. Pastor talked about this last week. That way we have a definition of what's going on. Hebrews 11. 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11. 1. Pay attention. We're going to be really going through this. It's the substance of things hoped for. Clearly, if it's there, it's in your face, you ain't got to hope for it. It's right there. And it's evidence, meaning I know something's going to happen even though it hasn't been accomplished yet. So that's what we're looking at. And this is why, as we look at disciples, why they should have this faith at that moment. Let's go to Matthew 10. Let's go to Matthew 10. We read this already. And when he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them the power. Now, they couldn't take care of this. this they couldn't take care of this demon right here. But it says right here, in 10, 17, they can't cast no demon out. But in 10 right here, we see that he gave them the power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So what that they didn't have the power? Uh-oh. It wasn't that they don't have the power. Same with us. Once you believe in Jesus Christ, we have power. So executing that power ain't the problem. It's do I have the faith to execute things? Or do I doubt? When we look at Hebrews 11, one, it said, faith is something things hope for, right? We have to look at ourselves sometimes. I know I do. Sometimes we just have to make sure we just trust God. Mustard seed. We have more faith in what we can't do than what God can accomplish. Sometimes we looking, I can't do that. I can't. I, they probably were doing that when the demon was, was doing all kind of crazy thing. They said they're like, man, I can't do nothing with this. You're right, you can't. But the source can. Let's keep going. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebedeus, whose surname was Thaddeus. Man, James, them some names. Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. I want us to understand this, even though they have the power in Matthew 10, one thing we have to clearly understand is faith wasn't a requirement for them to do these miracles. They didn't need faith. You say, why? Easy. Judas did it. Judas Iscariot was one of the, one of the people who was casting out demons and all those things. But he wasn't a believer. He didn't have faith in Jesus. They say it right there, Judas is scared, who also betrayed him, sold him out. So at this very moment, 
faith wasn't a requirement from the disciples. The disciples' faith was a requirement for them to do these miracles. Let's keep reading. These 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, so he sent them out. Matter of fact, let's go back to, let's, 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 let's pay attention. Let's go back to two right here. It says, now the names of the 12 apostles. First it said disciples in verse one. Now you get to verse two, it says apostles. Why? Because disciples means followers. Apostle means one who sent. So now they're qualified as apostles because he's sending them to do something. He's sending them to do a job. These 12 Jesus sent out, commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's proof of a job. He gave them a specific duty to do. You can tell them, Go out into the world, teach and agree. No, this is the, the people I want you to go to. As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Oh, look at this. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. They was raising people from the dead. That's, that's the kind of power they had. Let's pay attention. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff, for a worker is worthy of his food. Proof they got a job, they was what? Workers. So when we look at it, they weren't doing these things because they were believing or believers, but just simple fact that they had a job. God told them to do it. Yes, they were obedient. There have been plenty of things we didn't do before, but we didn't, that don't mean we believed in that person. Or even believed what we were supposed to do was going to happen. But we still went out and did it. And plenty of things I do at my job, I've been, mm, I don't know, but I still do it. And that was the same moment here. However, even though faith wasn't a requirement for them, it still should have built their faith. That's what it should have did. The disciples should have had their faith built or actually started to have faith in Jesus once they started doing these miracles, they knew it wasn't of themselves. Now I'm doing these miracles and I don't have to take any money. I ain't got to worry about taking no extra clothes, no extra shoes for my feet. I ain't got to worry about no food. But I'm going to be taken care of. Both of those things alone should have made them believers in Jesus and stre or strengthened their faith that they already were believers. Let's keep going. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go out into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace be up, come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from the house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Surely I say to you, it was more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So the whole point was for them to do their job, preach the kingdom is at hand. And with those miracles, those who believed, great. If not, judgment. So this was, this was a belief or not situation for the people that they came in contact with. A last note that we have to understand why they should have been strong believers is they're protected. Nothing happened to them. Now, when you start getting to the next verse, it starts talking about the future when it talks about they're going to do this, brother against brother, family member, and all those things. It's talking about what's going to happen in the future, not that very moment. So they were protected when they did all this stuff. You didn't see nothing harmful happen to them. You don't hear nothing when they came back. But instead, as we can see, their faith wasn't built as strong as it should have been. So let's go to Mark 9. Let's go to Mark 9, starting at verse 14, so we can get a deeper understanding of what was happening. Because here in 17, he didn't even talk about 
the boy was possessed. He just said, hey, he's epileptic and he goes in the water and in the fire. That's what it says in Matthew. But Mark 9 gets deeper with 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and the scribes disputing with them. Well, them scribes and Pharisees show love disputing, show love trying to find a problem. Immediately, when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. Now we see he got a mute spirit. And whenever it sees it, Sim, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid like stiff. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, but they could not. Now at this moment with the disciples, this wasn't the moment when he sent them out. It never says he took the power away from them that he gave to them in chapter 10. But at this very moment, they had seen something they ain't seen before with this. And so I believe that they they thought they could just execute and cast out the demon without faith. They just thought they could do the same old job that they were doing in 10. Oh, yeah, go, be gone. We straight. Get this demon up out of here. Understand, when they were by themselves in 10, they went in two. Here, it's all 12 of them and they can't get it done. With one. Because it was a requirement for faith to get this demon gone. That's why, that's why it says he could not. When we get to 19, he says he answered him and said, oh, faith, this generation, how long shall I be? It's like there's progression. There's levels to this. Okay, you were able to execute the job. And then now that you believe in me, or if you believe in me, then you should be able to believe in what you can accomplish through me. And the disciples didn't. The disciples didn't know what to do next. He says, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. We already talked about that. Then he brought him to him. And when he saw him immediately, this is what this is what happened to the disciples. Immediately the spirit convulsed him, fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Remember, the spirits up to this point, when they met Jesus, they'd be like, hold up, hold up, don't throw me out now, man. Throw me into the pigs, throw me somewhere. It, it ain't your time yet. Please, but this one, oh, this is a whole different level. He kept on with the same show. He said, I'm riding this out to the end. We saw that the spirit convulsed, fell on the ground, my phone at the mouth. This is shot Jesus. He said this in 21. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening? And he said from his childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He said, if you can do anything, you know how desperate a parent has to be when you say, if you can do anything, just give me something. 23, Jesus said to him, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You can say, what does that mean? Easy, Lord, you see, calling him Lord. Someone who has complete power and authority over you. So Lord, I know you can do something, but help my unbelief. We struggle with the exact same things in our life. 
Well, we believe in Jesus Christ. He Lord and Savior. I'm going straight to heaven. We, we can't wait to tell somebody that I'm sanctified, refried, laid to the side for Jesus, right? So that's not the issue. So it's very possible that we can believe but still have unbelief. Why? Because the unbelief is, I just don't know what God can do it in this situation. Lord, I know you can do all things. And I know you saved my soul, but this situation here in my life, my faith just ain't as strong. And we should understand that with the, with the father. Because Jesus asked him how long it's been going on. He said, since a childhood. So you imagine being a parent. And let's say as a child, since a childhood, so let's say this, let's say it's been 10 years. Let's say it's been happening since he was four and now all of a sudden he's 14. 10 years he's been watching this. Doesn't mean he ain't believed in God. But this situation still ain't accomplished yet. So it's very possible to still believe in God. But then in certain situations that we have in our lives, that's five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, 20 years, I'm still dealing with this. Still dealing with this with this person. They still doing whatever. And there have been many moments where we sit up there and be like, man, God, man, you ain't going to do that. Why? Because the situation keeps happening over and over and over and over. Sometimes we need to say the same thing in our lives. Lord, I believe, I know you saved my soul. I know you died for my sins, but help my unbelief in this situation. Strengthen my unbelief. I know it should be stronger because I know you can accomplish all things. I know you can't come through in my life. Even though the situation keeps happening and it's been years, I still know you can come through. Sometimes we need to say that. We need to say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's what he was dealing with. So now the situation gets worse because you've been hearing about Jesus. Now Jesus is in your town or who knows? He may have went traveling. Where Jesus at? You over there? Oh, yeah, I got to find him. We don't know how far he came from. And then you get to the disciples. And then once again, they do nothing. You get this close to Jesus, nothing happens. You got to have some unbelief. I'm sorry. So this is part of the reason why the demon, the, 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 the disciples didn't cast him out. Because they didn't have no faith. And the father didn't have no faith either. So you got two parties with no faith trying to get a miracle done. So that's why he had to come to Jesus. That's why Jesus said, oh, faith is in perverse generation. 24. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. 25. When Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him, enter him no more. We can make me base game two. Come out, don't you come back. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him and he became as one dead so that many people said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he come into the house, his disciples asked him privately why we could not cast him out. Now we finna get a little deeper. We saw that the disciples didn't, didn't have no belief that they cast out this demon. But let's look at what they should have done, what they could have done. First, one of the first thing they could have done was this. You go James 1.1. 1, 1. James 1.2. 1, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the taste tested of your faith produces patience. So oh. understand is there is a purpose in the testing of our faith. 
There's a there, there's a purpose when we go through things. Four, but let patience have its perfect work, that we may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The job is to for we can get, be perfect and complete. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So even in that moment, it says right there, if you lack wisdom, clearly the disciples had no faith. But clearly the next thing they should have did was at least turn to Jesus. You right there. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Lord, help. That's what number one source we should be going to. Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Here's number six, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. So when we ask, we need to make sure we got faith attached to that. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So understand when we ask God for something, we just need to trust him. That's what we need to do. That's one of the things really in building this belief. Next thing is this. Let's, let's look at the example. Let's go to 1 Samuel 17. Let's go to 1 Samuel 17. David, this is what we started Sunday school online with in Samuel. But this is something that the disciples, I mean, it's in 1 Samuel 17. It'd be, be nice if they would have brought this up, a thought of this situation. The example that David said as a youth. So let's go through this story. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gad, whose height was six cubits and a span. So pretty much nine feet, nine inches, almost 10 feet tall, same as a basketball goal, the height. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Oh, man. Now the staff of the spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron superhead weighed, spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shield bearer went before him. Ooh, I hate to be that shield bearer. Then he stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? You the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come after me. If he is able to fight and with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. The plan of this is the David and Goliath story. We all pretty much know this, but let's get this background. Ten. And the Philistines, this is what he said. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Oh, man, that's bold. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel, Saul was the king at that time, all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So let's understand this is faith as well. We got to put that fear behind. Whatever the situation looks like, we can, I don't care how fearful it is, I don't care how scared, we got to put that faith away, that fear away. Matter of fact, we got to put that faith we got in fear. Either we're going to have faith in fear or faith in God. With that faith in fear, we got to make sure that fear goes away. Let's look at this. It says, oh, they couldn't find one person. The children of Israel couldn't. Let's keep reading. They was all shook. Now we get to the point where David showed up to check on some things with his brothers and all those things. He was like, man, please, I'll go up. Y'all scared? Be scared. And it, it brings us here to verse 31. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's fail because of him. No, let no man's heart. This is David talking to Saul. Did You talking to the king and you still a pup, pretty much a teenager. Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight the fish team. So we got this little teenager ready to go fight. 
33, and Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Another thing we need to look at this is with our faith, God sets up an awesome testimony. This is an awesome testimony that's being set up because now you even have history of the Philistine who's 10 feet tall and clearly he's been winning, who's strong, but guess what? He's been fighting since he was your age. Ain't no way in the world you can accomplish this. 34, but David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, understand it, that, that lion and bear didn't go down not fighting. It said, when it rose against me, I caught it by a spear and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the army, he has defied the armies of the living God. 37. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hands of the Philistine. This is what the disciples should have did. They should have said, Jesus gave us the power to cast out demons, raise up people from the dead in Matthew 10 earlier. We should be able to have the power to do it now. It's simple. What really builds our faith is really remembering what God has brought us to before. Sometimes our testimonies are just big for ourselves. If we don't tell nobody else yet, but just us remembering how God has brought you out last month, then last year, then two years ago, then four years ago, then five, then, and all those things just strengthen our faith. Then we should be like, God is consistent. God has consistently brought me out. He gonna do it again, just that simple. This is what the disciples should have did. We got the power, we executed this before. So that means we should be able to do it now. But their faith wasn't strong. That's it. That's the only thing. The next thing I want us to look at this real quick as well. Once we recognize one of the biggest things that strengthen our faith, it's just remember what God brought us through. And he brought you through it before, he gonna do it again. The end, we make more difficult in our own mind, with our own fear. We know the end of David and Goliath, we know that David destroyed him with the pebble, hit him in the forehead and he, and he killed him. But the beginning of that was the faith in God. And the fact that God has brought me out with lion and bear. Understand, elevated lion, that the bear is bigger than the lion, and then Goliath is bigger than both of them. Same thing in our life. As tests and trials get bigger, it's for a reason. Because we have built up our strength in faith to be able to defeat the Goliath. So keep having that faith. Next thing we need to be looking at is this. John 5, this is Jesus talking, right? This is Jesus talking, 530. It says this, I can of myself do nothing. Recognize how small I am and how great God is. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Next thing we have to understand in our strength being built is, is it the will of the Father? 
so that I have to make sure that my will is lined up with his will. We understand this. We could talk about this. We talk about family members and sickness and going to the doctor. We can be praying my faith is strong, that God will deliver me and heal my body. Yes, if that's his will. But if it's not his will, then I need to make sure my faith is still with him. Understand, strong faith is me having faith in his game plan, having faith in what he wants done with my life. Not just me praying for anything and every time Jesus God come through. No, I have to understand that some of the things that I may want done on a part of his will. If things happen, a loved one gets sick and you recognize it's not God's will for your body to be healed, that's okay. I still got faith in you and I'm going to believe into the end and I'm going to execute my faith where? If I got to go and get treatment, I'm going to let my light shine. When I'm in the hospital with the nurses and the doctors, I'm going to let my light shine. If I've been in prison and I wasn't supposed to go unfairly, I'm still going to let my light shine in there. Why? Because it just ain't our neighbors that need to be saved. Nurses do. Doctors do. People in jail do. Everywhere. So that could be God's will for my life. It's for where he wants my life to shine. So understand, big part of faith is remember what God has done, he can accomplish. Another thing is I have to make sure what I have faith in is aligned with his will and not my will. Verse 36, 38. For I have come down from heaven, this Jesus talking, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent. So we need to have that mentality. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all has given, that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So if it is God's will not to heal my body for me to pass on, guess what? When I do pass on, when I do die, I still won. Why? Because absent with the body is present with the Lord. Either way, I'm still winning. But one thing in having faith in God is we need to make we we want to have enough faith in God where our light shines. So we just don't go to heaven. The people around us see the light and they can go too. That they believe as well. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. And finish this thing right here. Clearly, as we just read with Jesus, that he said he come to do the will of his father. He don't do nothing without it. So by Jesus healing this young man of this, this demon spirit, that was part of the will of the father. It was part of the will of God for him to get his son healed. The only thing that prevented the disciples from doing it was lack of faith. If they had the faith, the demon would have came out with them. But because they didn't, Jesus had to do it. And did any with this kind come out by nothing but prayer and fasting? Look, we talk about prayer and fasting. All of that is to align with God's will. So when I am praying, I am seeking the will of the Father. I am asking something that is aligned with his will for my life. This is not a wish list prayer. So when all those things, I get closer to God. 
there are some things in our life that can only be accomplished by prayer and fasting. Next thing fasting is, at this moment, they talk about from food. But we can fast from many things. Sometimes we may need to fast from TV so we can get closer to God. The whole point from fasting from God physically is so I can eat spiritually. I'm fasting from food physically, but spiritually, I can still read that word, eat on it every day. I can still start to pray. And in all those things, I get closer to God. That's the point. And we, as we get closer to God, there are so many great things and miracles that we can accomplish, but it's only through him. And that's another thing with prayer and fasting. It was the, if they were aligned, let's say this, because fasting is made until you get your breakthrough. And we talk about breakthrough when you get your answer and the strength that you need. We talked about this with David before with his son. He prayed and fasted for a long time, but it wasn't God's will for his son to still live, and he took his son. Immediately, right after he did that, David got his breakthrough, he got his answer, and he got up and started eating. And his response was, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. That was through fasting. So fasting, we're looking for that breakthrough, we're looking for that answer. But one thing is, this ain't no oatmeal, ain't no instant. This ain't no instant Quaker oat. At that very moment, when, when the man came with his son, with the demon spirit, it wasn't no, at one time doing no two-minute fast. But if the disciples had been praying and fasting before that point, it could have got done. Sometimes we want to make sure we get so in line with God's will, we can start praying. We'll start actually, we're already praying. But then fasting, not on a current situation, but maybe we'll just start fasting on a future one. Like the spirit has led me to fast. I don't know why at this moment, but I'm going to fast. Think about that. So in conclusion, We need to make sure our, our faith is strengthened by a few things. One is obviously we have to understand that the trying of our faith is a purpose to build patience, to strengthen us. Second thing we have to understand that we need to remember what God has done for us in the past. And then third, we need to make sure we're consistently praying. We're building that relationship and fasting. And then also we need to make sure we're aligned with his will, but that's gonna come from prayer and fasting. That way the things we're asking for are aligned with the will that he has for my life. Trust me, y'all, I've been asking to be a billionaire. Like, I'm just playing. So we make sure we're not asking for any old thing because the things we ask for that God is gonna bless us with it's ultimately going to be blessings, not just for us, but so we can let our light shine, so we can show other people love, just not for us. These are not selfish blessings, but so we can give to others. And in that, hopefully they can be strengthened if they're believers, or they can come to Jesus. Well, that concludes our lesson. And as I said earlier, we did not finish or get to 18. But we will, we will start, oh, we will start with verse 22. We definitely gonna move that on through. We're gonna start with Matthew 17, 22, but that concludes our lesson today. But before we want to conclude, we want to offer salvation to anyone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, their personal savior. First thing we want to ask you to do is. You got to recognize you're a sinner. 
Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, A-L-L. -L. So that ain't the problem. Here's the biggest problem is this. When you go to Romans 6.23, it says, the wages of sin is death. You go to that first part. We talk about death. That means you are separated from something. Physically, when our loved ones die, we're separated from them. We can't get to them. But here it's talking about spiritually, our soul is separated from God. Meaning at this moment, you don't know Jesus Christ, you are separated from God. Your relation, you are dead. Your soul is dead. Your soul is the one thing that lives forever. Physically, when we perish, that goes in the dirt. Our spirit goes back to Jesus, goes back to God, the Father. All right? So you recognize the problem is you sin. And then the wages, the cost for that is death. Many of you are separated to God. But then the end of Romans 6, 23 says, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus our Lord. So we just accept the gift. The gift is the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And believing that, having the faith, So if you're looking at this like, well, what do I do next? Let's go to Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this. If we, you will confess in your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. I'm paraphrasing. You would just believe with your heart. It's just that simple. That's all you have to do. Have to do. So if anyone wants to accept Christ now, let's pray. Close your eyes. Say, Father, say, Lord, I recognize right now that I'm a sinner. And I recognize the cost. The punishment for that sin is death, meaning I am separated from you. And I recognize today that I do not want that. And I recognize the solution is by believing in Jesus Christ with all my heart. Recognize that he has died for my sins and he rose on the third day with all power. Lord, I confess with my mouth right now that I believe in Jesus. And I recognize that with that belief that I am saved. Lord, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for Jesus. And I pray right now that you can teach me right now to be closer to you, to love you and love others. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. It is just that simple. You believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart, you are saved. And if you did that right now, please contact us. We want to celebrate with you. We want to give you tools to succeed. Please reach out to us at agapechristianwc.org on our Facebook page and also our YouTube channel. So that concludes our lesson today. So on behalf of Agape Christian Worship Center, I'm Brother Time. Remember, we have in service in Rancho Cucamonga. Rancho Cucamonga at Emmanuel Praise Fellowship. Let me see if I can pull up that address again. It's 95927th Street in Rancho Cucamonga. We won't be having service in Victorville today. So I want to make sure I remind you, all right? So on that note, on behalf of Agape Christian Worship Center, I pray that everyone have a wonderful, blessed day, a blessed week. And remember, Lord willing, I'll see you next Sunday. God bless. <laughs>